Well, welcome back to the Reflecting the Light series. We took a couple weeks off of our normal routine. We've been studying the book of John. We called the series Reflecting the Light because in John 1, it says that Jesus is the light of the world and we are reflecting Him. We're trying to be like Him. We took the last couple weeks around Easter. We took Good Friday and did a special communion service. If you remember back in John 6, Jesus had a really hard teaching, and many of the people that were following him walked away because he said the words, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood to enter into that kingdom. And, and he was foreshadowing what was going to happen on the cross. He was foreshadowing the symbolism that comes with communion. So a couple weeks ago for our online service, we did communion together. For those that were able to be with us in person, we had a brunch and we celebrated communion together. It's a part of that And man, I wish for those of you that couldn't be in person, I wish that you could have been. You were with us in spirit. We wanted to love on you in that. You are a part of our church and you're an important part of our church. And we're praying that God will make a way for you today. So we're going to pick up in John chapter 7. This is part 15 of our Reflecting the Light series. I don't know how many parts this is going to be. We're walking through the book of John. God has called us this year to learn to love and lead like Jesus. Jesus his mission. We are to become like Him. Not that we're to become God, but that we're to love the things that Jesus loved. We're to be against the things that Jesus was against. That's part of our mission as believers, as followers, as disciples. We are to be a part of those things. And so, we want to make sure that we do that well. So today, as we go through the Reflecting the Light, I want you to go ahead and turn to John chapter 7. We're going to cover approximately the first 16, 17 verses. We're going to look at it a little bit quicker, but I want to just get you up to speed. Jesus was hanging out with his biological brothers. And I say biological, we know that Joseph was not his biological father, that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she conceived Jesus and she bore him. And then we know that Uh, Joseph and Mary had other children. We know at least James was one of those children. And and they didn't believe in who Jesus was in the beginning. Matter of fact, they were giving him kind of a hard time. They were kind of ribbing him a little bit. So this time of year, it was coming up, it was kind of the summertime and the seventh month is kind of where this falls together because we know that because the festival of tabernacles or booths was happening. And so Jesus's brothers were kind of giving him a hard time about going there. See, this festival happens in the autumn. It's a celebration of the the harvest that also commemorates Israel's years of wandering in the wilderness when they lived in temporary shelters or Sukkoth, or booths. There's a lot of different names for it. But there was, they were there, and they spent seven days living basically in tents to kind of remind them of the time that they wandered as a people in the wilderness before God brought them into the Promised Land after He brought them out of the land of Egypt. So they have this feast every year. And we know that Jesus... Had, you know, the Pharisees kind of came against Jesus when he healed the man on the Sabbath. And that was approximately when, a year before this, because we knew that it happened at that time a year before. So we believe that, that there was about a year between that healing on the Sabbath and this festival. And that brings you to this conversation that Jesus is having with his brothers. His brothers were trying to get him to go to Judea. He was in Galilee. They were trying to get him to go to Judea to go to the festival. And that's where we're going to pick up in John chapter 7, verses 1 through 9, if you want to get there with me. Verse 1 says this, After this, Jesus traveled around Galilee. He wanted to stay out of Judea where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. But soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters or booths. There's many names, tabernacles. It's all the same festival. And Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. I read that with some sarcasm because that's the belief, I think that's the tone which they were saying, like, Look, man, how are your followers going to see your awesome miracles? How are you going to become famous if you don't actually show up? If you're out here hiding, 
They were mocking him. And verse 5 tells us, For even his brothers didn't believe in him. Jesus replied, Now is not the right time for me to go, but you can go any time. The world can't hate you, but it does hate me because I accuse it of doing evil. You go on. I'm not going to this festival. A lot of translations have, I'm not yet going to this festival. However you do it, he says, hey, I'm not going right now because my time has not yet come. After saying these things, Jesus remained in Galilee. I want you to get this. Jesus' brothers, those that were closest to him, did not believe in what he was doing. You know, sometimes the greatest ridicule that we will get, the greatest uh, condemnation we will get were, are, is from those that are closest to us, those that know us. God wants to do great things through us, but the people that know us best often miss what God's trying to do. And they can sometimes be our biggest haters, if you want to use that terminology. I, I sometimes don't like the word haters because we use it kind of flippantly in the wrong thing. But they're the ones that kind of, you know, maybe if you got siblings, they might mock you like, yeah, right, you can do that. But when God has put something in your heart, when God has given you a passion and given you a mission, those negative voices are going to come in. Even Jesus had to deal with that mocking. He had to deal with that from his brothers I don't know if there were sisters involved. I don't know. We don't really have a full background to Jesus' family life. But we do know that those that were closest to him mocked him and did not believe all the hype. So we pick up a little bit later, and Jesus does go to the festival, and he keeps himself hidden. So the Jewish leaders were, were searching for him. He knew they'd be searching for him. So Jesus, I don't know where the other disciples were. I'm assuming they went on to the festival. I don't know if Jesus was taking a vacation, was hanging out with his family. I don't know exactly how that all worked. But Jesus went to the festival by himself because it's easy to blend in. He kind of went around to the festival. Remember, this is a seven-day-long festival. He kind of went around and just kind of heard what was going on, see what was there. And all throughout the crowd of people, they were debating about him. Some were saying, I don't know how he, I don't know what this guy is. I don't know if he can be, could he be the Messiah? No, he's, he's of Satan. He's just a false prophet. All these other things. There was so much talk and gossip around Jesus. And those that really wanted to support him didn't speak up as loud as those that were negative because those that wanted to support him were afraid of the religious leaders who did hate Jesus, who were trying to kill him. So there was a lot of chatter and a lot of gossip going around about him. He'd made a splash. He'd been healing people. Things were happening. So Jesus hears all this gossip. And about halfway through the festival, he speaks up. And I want you to jump down to verse 14. And let's pick up there together. It says, Then midway through the festival, Jesus went up to the temple and began to teach. The people were surprised when they heard him. How does he know so much when, he's, when he hasn't been trained, they ask? Remember, Jesus didn't sit at a, at a rabbi's feet like somebody that was going to be a teacher or a religious leader or, or a rabbi. They would sit for years at the feet of a, of, a, of a rabbi. Once they turned 13, they would have went down that path. Jesus was a carpenter. So Jesus told them, My message is not my own. It comes from God who sent me. Anyone who wants to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or is merely my own. Those who speak for themselves want glory only for themselves, but a person who seeks to honor the one who sent him speaks truth, not lies. Moses gave you the law, but none of you obeys it. In fact, you're trying to kill me. The crowd replied, You're demon-possessed. Who's trying to kill you? Jesus replied, I did one miracle on the Sabbath, and you were amazed. But you work on the Sabbath too. When you obey Moses' law of circumcision, actually this tradition of circumcision began with the patriarchs long before the law of Moses. For if if the correct time for circumcising your son falls on the Sabbath, you go ahead and do it as not to break the law of Moses. So why should you be angry with me for healing a man on the Sabbath? Look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. Now remember, the Jewish leaders were looking for Jesus because he had healed on the Sabbath. And many believe, like I said, this event took place a year before 
because every year this festival would come up. It's one of three festivals where people, if they could, would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival, just like the Passover. They would come together and they would celebrate to remember. So Jesus was pointing out to the Jewish leaders, man, look, you break the Sabbath too. When you circumcise on the eighth day, if that eighth day falls on a Sabbath, you go ahead and do it. Because you don't want to break the law of Moses. So there's conflict there. Jesus is saying, look behind the surface. Look at the heart behind what I'm doing. I healed somebody. I made their body whole on the Sabbath. So Jesus was pointing these things out. I'm going to break down two things that I want to take out of this passage today for us to go home with. And the first thing is this, the motives. The conflict Jesus had with the religious leaders really comes down to motives. The religious leaders had their own agenda, their own motives, and they liked being in a place of authority and power. Jesus went against that. Jesus actually poked holes in the things that they were doing because they would do and say things that were contrary to really what Scripture was actually saying, and to the will and heart of God. They were really great at quoting the laws, but really bad at living them out. But yet, if anyone else didn't follow them, they, 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 became, they came down on them hard. And so they were, they were concerned about themselves, their power, and their authority. And Jesus didn't bow down at their feet. He actually spoke very openly at the areas that they struggled And so they they saw Jesus as a threat to their power, a threat to their authority. And that's all they were really concerned about. That was their motives. Look at verses 18 and 19 again. It says, Those who speak for themselves want glory only for themselves. He's talking about the Pharisees. He's talking about the religious leaders, how they they lift each other up and they, they highlight each other. I talked about this a couple weeks ago how we get into the place where we take these popular Christian singers, the popular Christian speakers, and we put them up on pedestals and we highlight, we get more excited about who's coming to speak than about God. And that happened in this time as well. And then if you continue on, the verse says, But a person who seeks to honor the one who sent him speaks truth, not lies. Moses gave you the law, but none of you obey, and in fact you're trying to kill me. See, what happens is, is in the church world, pastors often lose sight of what's important. We as religious leaders often lose sight of what's important and we get focused on what we want. We get focused on what we think is right, what we think is we should be doing about what lifts us up more than what lifts God up. Man, we see it all the time when, when some of the famous pastors fall and we find out that there's that there's sin in their lives, like very public sins, and, and, and we, we get, become disheartened, and, and we, we've created a culture, a kind of this rock star culture in Christianity where we lift people up, and they don't live up to those expectations, and, and people overlook the fault because so many good things are happening. You know, God can move in spite of us. God can move in spite of who we are. That doesn't mean that we're okay. That just means that God's going to fulfill His mission. And so even in our culture today, we see this. And pastors who come in with good intentions often lose sight of the real purpose, and they get caught up in their own hype. They get caught up in their own authority and in their own power, and often miss the love of God for the people that are around them. Matthew 23 shows us a little more insight into the religious leaders, and I want to read to you a passage out of this. Matthew 23, verses 1 through 7 says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to to his disciples, Teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you. Which is great. He's saying, look, listen to the Pharisees. They're teaching the law. See, they would teach the law, right? But listen to the next words. He says, but don't follow their example. For they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do is for a show. On their arms, they wear extra-wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside, and they wear robes with 
long tassels and they love to sit at the head of the table at banquets and in the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to receive the respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplace and to be called rabbi. This was the beginning of seven woes that Jesus spoke to the religious leaders. I'm not going to go all the way through. It's a long passage. We don't have time. But he was saying, woe to you, religious leaders, because you're all about the show, but you're not about the love of God. You're not about the Father's heart. You know the Scripture, you know the law, but you don't know the heart and drive behind that law. You just like that you being able to teach that law gives you authority and that people listen to you and they put you up on a pedestal. Be honest, this is one of the reasons I'm not really big on titles. And I'm conflicted when it comes to a title. People call me pastor because that's what I am. I'm a pastor. It's what God's gifted me and called me to do. Pastor means shepherd, to shepherd people. So when I walk into a business or I go into certain meetings and people address me as pastor, I know that it's a sign of respect. But in a way, I kind of cringe because I see people that rely on their titles. I don't need a title to be a pastor. I'm a pastor because that's who God ordained me to be. There's nothing wrong with a title, but when the title is what we're striving for more than to honor God with what we do, then the title's all the praise we're ever going to have. When we stand before God, we're not going to hear, well done my good and faithful pastor. That's the tough part. Because we get caught up in the titles and we love to label people apostle and evangelist and healer and all these things. And yes, we see it in Scripture. We see where people are called apostles. We see those things. But those things are descriptive of who they are by what they do. It's not something that we bestow on people to give them a rank. Actually, Scripture says, Woe to you pastors, because you're going to be judged more harshly. Woe to you teachers. Yeah, I don't carry it lightly. And I don't often wear the title. I don't introduce myself as pastor very often. Actually, usually it doesn't come up into a conversation until somebody says, hey, what do you do? I'm just Larry. And the reason that I do that, not because I want to demean what I do, is I don't want people to see me as a title. I want people to see me for who I am. And I want them to see Jesus come out of me in spite of my title. Because I think it speaks more that I follow Christ without the title. Because it's expected of me if I'm a pastor. They expect you to, to talk about Jesus. But that every part of my life flows out of that. Look, he goes on and talk a little bit more about how they, they, wanna, they want those respectful places. They want to be at the seats of honor. They want to be at the head of the table. It's a tough place to be. See, their pride and their sin pointed to what was happening in their hearts. And Jesus pointed that out to them, but He did it in the right context. I believe that Jesus pointed these things out to the religious leaders not to put them down, but to give them an opportunity to repent and have eternal life. To really have true relationship with God. Because that's Jesus' number one goal. He wants all people to follow Him. He wants none to perish. And right now, in that point, the religious leaders were missing God. They were doing all the work. They were saying all the right things. But they were totally missing relationship with God. And they were missing the Messiah standing right in front of them. The purpose of the religious leaders is to teach and to train the people about the ways of God. To teach and interpret the the law, not to give them burdens and to bear them down, but to give them the freedom that the law brings them through God. 
Instead, it became about pride and power. Instead, it became about how they could maneuver themselves into positions of authority. Now think about this, and I, and I know this is true for me, and it's, I'm going to guess it's probably true for at least some of you. The leaders that I respect the most lead with humility and love, not with pride and harsh words. Servant leadership. They lead with humility. Those are the leaders that we want to follow. So I want to shift gears for a second. The crowd was confused. They were gossiping about Jesus. Going to go back to that for a little bit. We've talked about the the religious leaders, and there's all this gossip and chatter, and, and, and apparently the word about Jesus just, it caused quite a stir. They hadn't had a prophet, a true prophet, for 400 years. And here Jesus comes and he speaks words that are really above what his, his title should be as far as his training. But yet he seems to have this insight from God, and, and when he comes and people are healed and and thousands of people are fed from just loaves and fish. They didn't know what to do with them. Some thought this power came from Satan. Some thought it was all this big fraud, like he had some kind of magic trick along with it. Maybe you felt that way about some things. You get skeptical, you don't understand, and, and so you kind of feel that way. They didn't know what to make of him, they, but they couldn't deny the miracles. They couldn't deny the way he talked. I mean, look again at verses 14 through 16. It said, midway through the festival, Jesus went up to the temple and began to teach. The people were surprised when they heard him. How does he know so much when he hasn't been trained? And he gives them the answer, my message is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. It comes from God. Jesus pointed to the source And see, that's where I get the, the key point for us to not be deceived is to go to the source, to go to the Word of God and to study it and to know it. Do you know that you don't need a pastor, a priest, or anyone else to interpret the Word of God for you? Now, there are tools that help because sometimes we get off base. We can take a scripture out of context. So there is a form to it, and that's part of my job is to equip you to be able to do that and to do it well. But it's up to you to study Scripture. It's up to you to know Scripture. Not what I tell you, but for you to actually know it. And if you get confused, if you have questions, that's why you have the Holy Spirit. That's why you have pastors and friends and leaders to help guide you through that. Not Google. Google can lead you astray just as quick as anything else. Even with Google, you've got to know the right places to go. He gives you the key to not be deceived in verse 17. It says, anyone who wants to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or is merely my own. Let me read that again. Did you catch that? Anyone who wants to know the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or it is merely my own. Jesus just said it takes discernment. I know he didn't say that word right there. But he's saying, look, if you're seeking after God, if you're truly hungering after Him, He will help you to know what is right through the power of the Holy Spirit. Anyone who wants to know the will of God, whether my teachings are from God or not, you got to go to Him. You got to go to the Scriptures. This discernment, this word means to discern, to discover, to understand. Discernment is a gift given to us by the Holy Spirit. All right, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives us the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit, He gives great faith to another, and to someone else, he gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts, and He alone decides which gift each person should have. 
the power of the Holy Spirit helps us to understand whether what is being spoken is from God or not. See, He gave us the, the power, and I know he, he talks about the sermon of the message from Spirit. Sometimes that's messages in tongues and prophecy. But there's always been false teachers. The enemy comes up and raises up things that have just enough truth to draw you away. But it's the Holy Spirit that kind of says, wait, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. That gives you a check in the Spirit. Have you ever felt that way? You, you heard somebody speak something, you're kind of like, well, wait a minute, I'm not sure that lines up. Some of you have done that when I've spoken. And there have been times where I've spoken something out of context and didn't realize it and had to correct it. And there have been other times where I've been able to show what I was talking about and where it fits into what God's doing. But we can't just take people at that face value. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in us to help us to weed through those things. That power of the Holy Spirit helps us to understand. We also have Scripture to help us. Look at Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. It says, For the Word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes. And He is the one to whom we are accountable. The Word of God, it's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts through all that junk so that we can see the truth. The Holy Spirit, partnered with the Word of God, gives us the discernment to know what we're hearing is from God or whether it's not. Gives us that check in our spirit. Much of Paul's writings and Peter's as well, much of the New Testament was written to guard against false teachers because false teachers would pop up and they would teach things like, you know, Jesus is it. There is no God the Father or no Holy Spirit. It's just Jesus or they would teach things that were all about um, how we do these great works to get the favor of God. And they would use Jesus as a springboard and they would say just enough of the truth that they would deceive people. See, when we're seeking hard after God, when we're seeking to have a relationship with Him, it's much harder for us to be deceived because the Holy Spirit's going to make and do that work inside of us. He's going to sh teach us. He's going to give us that check in our spirit. Now, we can choose to ignore that check and follow a false teaching or get caught up in somebody's pride or any of those things. It's easy for us to get led astray. It's easy for us to fall off that way. You can, you can condemn people all you want. You can complain and say, oh, I can't believe that pastor did this or that. But you know what? If it wasn't for the grace of God and us seeking after Him, we could be that person. We could fall that way. We could get caught up in our own hype. So I want to wrap things up for you in just a minute. The first thing is this. Keep your motives in check and your relationship with God in, in fresh. That's really the wrap-up. Keep your motives in check and keep the relationship with God fresh. Matthew 22, 37 through 40, I, I usually I quote this. This is our foundational scripture. This is how we do it. So Jesus replied, it's the most important commandment. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And second and equally as important is to love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on those two commandments. See, when we're focused on loving God, Man, God, we worship you. We love you. We want to honor you. We don't get puffed up because it's not all about us. It's about His mission to redeem mankind and our role in that. So if we're loving God and thanking God for who we are and seeking after Him and reading His Word and just taking it in, then we reflect that light, that Word, Reflect who Jesus is in the second half of this. And second and equally important is to love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. We focus on loving God and loving others. We're not going to get puffed up in our own stuff. We're not going to get off track because we're going to be in line with His will. We're going to reflect His light well because we're worshiping Him and that light is being poured into us and then what gets poured out of us 
is that love of God for other people. And that's our job. That's our mission. That's why we exist. Not why pastors exist, not why churches exist, but why we exist, you and me. It's to love the Lord our God with all our hearts and to love our neighbor, to help God redeem mankind. That's our mission. And no matter what your title is, no matter what your job is, no matter what you do, the mission is the same. The mission is the same. So I want to pray over you today, and and I want to ask, you know, do you identify with the Pharisees? Is there a little check in your spirit going, ooh, that's kind of me. I've been really wrapped up in my title, what people think about me. Are you struggling with finding out what's true and what's right and, and, and understanding who you should listen to? Put your focus and your relationship on Jesus. Spend time with Him in prayer. Spend time in His Word. Allow the Holy Spirit to fill your life so that you can know these things. So that you can understand what God is about. So you can understand how to reflect Him in your daily life. Those are the keys to this. Now, I want to pray over you today. And if if you're struggling with any of this, please click the prayer button and allow our host to talk with you and to pray with you. And we're going to pray together right now. Jesus, I pray over each person that's watching this right now, and I ask that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that pride and ego would be put at check, and that, Lord, we would learn to love you with all our hearts, mind, and soul, and that we would learn to love others the way that you do. Lord, we want to reflect you every day. Help us not to be deceived. Help us not to, to treat others with disrespect, but, Father, help us to learn and love the way you do. And I pray right now that your hand will be upon each one. Pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would anoint us to do your work, Lord, that we would live on mission for you, that we would see all of our community redeemed by your love, your grace, and your compassion. We thank you for the opportunity to do this today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Again, please... If you need prayer, please click on that prayer button. Allow us to pray with you. The chat room is going to stay open for about 15 more minutes. We encourage you to get on there, build some relationships. We love you, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great week.